السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل ألم يجعل كيدهم في تضليل وأرسل عليهم طيرا أبابيل ترميهم بحجارة من سجيل فجعلهم كعصف مأكول رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد uh, إن شاء الله تعالى we're meeting now for the third time to discuss Surah Al-Fil the first time we did a comprehensive overview of the connections between the surahs, the series of surahs beginning with Surah Al-Fil all the way to the end of the Mus'haf. The next session, which was last week, we talked about a historical background that is important to remember before we get into the contents of Surah Al-Fil itself. And today, inshallah ta'ala, as we discuss the word-by-word analysis and the overview of the surah in light of the insights of scholars of the past, inshallah, when we study their insights, we will see why that analysis is important and why that background plays a central role in developing a good understanding of this remarkable surah. So we begin, inshallah ta'ala, with, a, with an interesting comment. This is made by Dr. Fadl Salih al-Sam al-Ra'i. هي سورة فيها عبرة لكل طاغية متكبر متجبر في كل العصور والأزمان. He says, this surah has a warning and a lesson for every, for every rebellious, arrogant, a tyrant that lives in any age, in any time, in any civilization, any nation. So he says, this is not just a surah talking about the oppression of Abraha against the Kaaba. This is sending a message to anyone who hopes to uh, you know, wreak havoc upon civilian populations and overpower a, one, a nation or a ruler trying to overpower another nation by means of their military might with the understanding what are they going to do to fight against this. They have no military capability to stand up to us. And with that you know, assumption, with that arrogant assumption, they go in and they don't care about the consequences. You know, when a, when a society is not in power, they talk about the rule of law. And they call people to abide by the rule of law. But when the society has power, they say the law is for everyone else. And we are above the law, we're beyond the law. And the law would apply, it's a nice thing to apply to, but we have a special situation. And who's going to stop them, even if they trample all over the law and the regulations, they're the most powerful you know, civilization, who's going who's gonna to question them? Who's going to question their oppression? And this is something that has happened throughout history. It's not difficult to see examples of that even in our time. But this is something that, you know, that the surah is uh, alluding to. Now he gives reasons why he thinks this is the case in the surah, why we shouldn't limit it to a discussion only of the historical accounts, which of course are critical. لِذَا جَاءَ فِعْلْ تَرَى this is why the verb tara came, alam tara. Now there are different ways of saying this. The first part of the ayah roughly translated is, didn't you see? That's the first part, didn't you see? Common translations will read, didn't you see how your Lord dealt with the people of the elephant? This is probably a common translation you've heard before. But he's commenting only on the first phrase, alam tara, and specifically the verb to see. That's been used in the present tense. بِصِيغَةِ الْمُضَارِعِ لِلْدَلَالَةِ عَلَى الْإِسْتِمْرَارِ وَالتَّجَدُّدِ and the specific use of that. Now in English translation, it comes out as past tense, right? Alam tara, it comes out as, didn't you see? And clearly if you understand English, that's past tense. But in Arabic, there's a rhetorical function here. And as opposed to saying, amara aita, right? You could use the past tense function also, but that wasn't used. When that's used, the past tense, it alludes to something continuous. In Arabic rhetoric, in, in balagha, in linguistics. It re- refers to something that didn't happen once, that happens over and over again. And this surah from a linguistics point of view, we'll, we'll l- learn something amazing about this surah. How the change of tenses carry amazing lessons in them. So that use just of the mudari, the present future tense in the Arabic, with the word lam, regardless of the presence of the word lam, indicates that this is not just something to observe and think about for that time, but for all time. Two more benefits. Alam tara fiha dalalatan lughwiyatan. In the phrase alam tara, there are two, two further uh, evidences and benefits. فَقَدْ تَكُونُ اسْتِفْهَامْ عَنِ الرُّؤْيَةِ الْقَلْبِيَّةِ وَالْبَصَرِيَّةِ 
بِمَعْنَا أَلَمْ تَرَى فُلَانٍ It could be referring to something you see physically or something you remember in your heart or something you can visualize. That, you know, so didn't you see, it could be taken literally, literally. But didn't you see can also be taken figuratively. And figuratively, even in English, it's the same exact way it's understood in classical Arabic. What that is is, didn't you see how people in the past were destroyed? Now, when, when I say that to you, didn't you see that the nation of Ad and Thamud, etc., etc., were de- destroyed? I don't claim that you were there watching it happen when I say, didn't you see? But what I mean by that is, didn't you think about it? Didn't you realize? Haven't you thought? Haven't you heard enough of the news already? You understand? So when you, see, when you use the word seeing sometimes, you don't mean it literally, you mean it figuratively. Even when somebody is explaining something to you, at the end of it you say, ah, oh, I see. And you're on the phone, you don't see anything. Right? And they explain something to you, they say, oh, I see. Right? So you're using the word, but not in a literal sense, but in a figurative sense. Why is that important? Because this alam tara, this question, according to the majority of Mufassirun, has been posed to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So obviously he, he didn't see the elephant army come. He wasn't there actually. He was according to most accounts, as we mentioned last time, born at least 50 days after the event. In the same year, but at least 50 days after. So clearly he didn't see this event. But he's heard it over and over again as we will see, or heard about this event over and over again as we will see in the commentary of the Mufassirun. So, the second rhetorical benefit, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ تَكُونُ بِمَعْنَى التَّعْجِيبِ بِمَعْنَى أَلَمْ يَنْتَهِ عِلْمَكَ إِلَى ذَلِكَ إِلَى ذَلِكَ You know, it produces the meaning of creating a shock. Didn't you realize? Haven't you thought about? You know, when somebody talks to you like that, they're trying to evoke emotions in you. And that is what Allah Azza wa Jalla is doing for His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when He talks to him that way. Now here we have to understand something incredible about the Qur'an's discourse and iltifat. I know this is a lot of heavy terminology, but I'll make it as simple as I can. Iltifat refers to the transitions in the Qur'an. Sometimes Allah is talking to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other times He's talking to all of humanity. Other times He's talking to disbelievers. Other times he's telling the Prophet what to tell them. Right? He, t- he doesn't want to tell them directly, he tells the Prophet to tell them. Qul, tell them. Right? He doesn't tell them directly, he tells his messenger to tell them. Right? Sallallahu alayhi wa Sometimes he's talking to Ya Ahl al Kitab. Sometimes Ya Bani Israel. Sometimes Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu. You understand? There are different audiences. But now in this surah, who's the audience? The messenger is being told. The messenger is being told. But the Qur'an is to be recited. So even though the messenger is being told sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who else can hear? The kuffar can. The disbelievers can. And they realize two things as this conversation is happening. One, that Allah is speaking to His messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, And two, that He is talking about an event that they themselves saw. Maybe He didn't see, but according to most narrations, a good chunk of the population that was there at the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, especially the elders of Quraysh, they actually remembered the eye account the physical account of what happened. So when, when these accounts are being given, two things are being learned. One, the, the messenger is being talked to while acknowledging that the kuffar can hear what's being said. So th- these two things are important. Now we look at uh, some commentary by Shawkani rahimahullah. وَهُوَ تَعْجِيبٌ لَهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم بِمَا فَعَلَهُ اللَّهِ And this is to, to give the messenger in a sense of amazement and wonder in regards to what Allah Himself did with the people of the elephant. As though he is saying, قَدْ عَلِمْتَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ You already know Muhammad sallallahu الله عليه أَوْ عَلِمَ النَّاسَ الْمَوْجُودُونَ فِي عَصْرِكَ Or the people who are present in your time, they also know very very well. وَمِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ And even the people that came after them, بِمَا بَلَغَهُمْ مِنَ الْأَخْبَارِ الْمُتَوَاتِرَةِ مِنْ قِصَّةِ أَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Because of what came to them from continuous narratives and narrations and people telling the story over and over again of the story of the elephant. Now it's important to know why is this, why would the people know about the story of the elephant? Why would it be so popular? Well, the entire city had to be evacuated. Right? They had to go up in the mountains. And this city was gonna be finished. And the Arabs, I told you last time, they didn't keep regular calendar. So you know after this incident, you know what they used to say? Oh, such and such thing happened two years after Am al-Fil. Or a year you know, before Am al-Fil. In other words, their calendar became the year of the elephant. This was such an important thing to them, that the entire calendar revolved around it. And they would tell their children this story. And of course, you know that the Quraysh lived off of the importance of the Kaaba. So this became somewhat of a religious justification for you know, even giving the Kaaba more reverence. Look how Allah protected you know, the, it, by this, this kharafa, this unusual, unnatural, paranormal activity. You know, in, in this way, He protected this Kaaba. Look at how that happened. So they would use that as justification 
for their legitimacy of having the Kaaba as the center of the religion, even though they, they, had, they had introduced paganism in there. وَمَا فَعَلَ اللَّهُ بِهِمْ فَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُؤْمِنُونَ This is the last part of Shawkani's commentary. He said, just in the alam tara kayfa, Allah Azza wa Jal, it is as though he's saying, didn't you realize what Allah does to his enemies? So what's wrong with you? Why don't you believe in him? You're using that to take pride in how Allah protected his house. Then what's, you know, why don't you take that next step towards iman? Then this hamza, this, you know, putting this statement in the form of a question. وَالْحَمْزَةُ لِلتَّقْرِيرِ كَأَنَّهُ قِيلْ قَدْ جَعَلَ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي تَضْلِيلِ أَوْ قَدْ you know, قَدْ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ So this, you know, putting it in the form of a question, didn't you see how your master, how your Lord dealt with the people of the elephant? When it's put in the form of a question, what's the purpose of that? Is to give emphasis to it. And I don't want to just use the word emphasis, you know, casually, because there are so many things in Arabic for emphasis. So I want to be careful and, and precise. What it, this does is it evokes the conscience of someone who's been done a favor. That's what the rhetorical question is used for the most part. In other words, I'm talking to you and I say, didn't I help you last year? Now there, one way of saying it is I helped you last year. That's one way of saying it. But if I really want to make you feel bad, you know what I would say? Didn't I help you last year? You know what that suggests to the listener? It seems as though you have forgotten what I did for you last year. So I'm going to put it in the form of a question because from your attitude it seems that you've forgotten. Right? So I'm going to put it in the form of a question. And that's what Allah Azza wa Jal does. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Now again, we have to understand, this question is directed at two parties. One party is the messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have to understand why Allah would ask his messenger this question. The other is indirectly, this question is being posed to the kuffar. Now the, the fact that the question is being posed to the kuffar is easy to understand. They clearly haven't appreciated this favor that Allah had done them because they're still openly committing the crime of shirk. And they've polluted the house of Allah with idols. But how do we understand this question being posed to the messenger wasallam? Because again, it's done to, to evoke a memory. Well, you see, the, the, the purpose of that is, do you realize how Allah comes to the help of His house? And you don't realize that he is your master, he will come to your help also. In other words, the messenger is being given a guarantee of the help and victory from Allah through whatever means it takes. Be it, you know, uh, you know, there may not be any means in front of the messenger. This is a Makki surah, so he has no political power, he has no massive armies, he has no room to negotiate. People laugh at him and spit at him, and you know, people ridicule the people that follow him. So, from a social and political point of view, he has no clout. Well, add, actually, add to that, even from an economic point of view, he's not in a very good position. But. But Allah is saying, even though the Meccans were not in a very good position, Allah Azza wa Jal protected that house, and He is the same master you have. So this by extension, the messenger is being, you know, his, he's being given consolation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ قَرِيبًا مِّن مَكَّةً Now we're going a little bit into the historical account. We'll go back and forth inshaAllah. When, he, when Abraha reached near Mecca, خَرَجَ إِلَيْهِ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ uh, then Abdul Muttalib came to him, وَعَرَضَ عَلَيْهِ ثُلُثَ أَمْوَالِ تَهَامَ لِيَرْجِعَ فَأَبَى He offered him the land of Tahama. We talked about the plains of Tahama last time, if you recall. Abu, uh, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet والسلام, tried to negotiate with him sort of a peaceful settlement. And he said, I'll give you the, a third of the revenues, of the assets, from the treasury of the plains of Tahama. We'll give you that. We're willing to give you all of that. Uh, but he returned because the uh, the armies of uh, Abraha fa Abba he refused wa Abba wa Abba and he prepared and loaded up his armies as a show of defiance. I don't need your negotiations. Your negotiations mean nothing to me. In other words, he wasn't concerned with making a peaceful settlement. He wanted to make a statement. And this is something again we learn about people or nations and powers that have power over others. No matter how much the other tries to negotiate by peaceful means, they have to make their statement and they don't care at the cost or the, the destruction that will come as a result. Now, Ashabul Fil, you know, the, the common translation, the people of the elephant. The word elephant is singular. But we know from last time also, at least 9 to 13 elephants were there. So why not, you know, Afyan? Why not, you know, elephants? Why use the singular? Well, it's used one because the most famous of them was what they were known for. When they say the elephant, it's referring specifically to an elephant whose name is known in Arishans as Mahmud. 
that was the elephant's name, that, that's what they had called it, it was a behemoth, it was a huge, huge elephant. And so they were famous for that one. So they're the people of the elephant, referring to that specific one. But also, feel is ism jama, which means it's a singular word that can refer to an entire category. Now, if you wanna, if you look at it from the point of view of ism jama, then your translation is gonna be affected in English. You can no longer say the people of the elephant, you're probably more better off saying the elephant people. In other words, people that were identified with the army of the elephant. Now that of in the middle, which is a necessity in idafa, is something of a literary problem in English, as opposed to the Arabic here. If you look at it as ism jama, the idafa, what it does is it creates an identification. These people were identified with the army filled with elephants. Now, uh, this, this uh, ashab al field, this phrase, we're gonna come back to in more detail inshallah ta'ala when the time comes, but we still have to answer a couple of other things about the phrase alam tara. So we'll read through my notes inshallah. Al awwal. Lima qal alam tara ma'a anna hadihi al waqi'a waqa'at qabla al babath bi zaman in tawil. How come he said, didn't you see, even though this event occurred a long time ago, even before the appointment of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bi zaman in tawil, a long time ago? Al murad min al ru'ya. Al-ilm wa tazkir The purpose of saying didn't you see The purpose of mentioning seeing Is two things Knowledge and reminder And it's, uh, that's exactly the case Don't you know what happened? It's another way of saying it Didn't you see is another way of saying Don't you know what happened? So knowledge And reminder Have you forgotten what happened? Wa tazkir These are the two purposes of it وَهُوَ إِشَارَةٌ إِلَىٰ أَنَّ الْخَبْرَ بِهِ متواتر. And it indicates, it seems to indicate this language that the news of this event was flowing continuously among the people. This was a common narrative. فَكَانَ الْعِلْمُ الْحَاصِلْ بِهِ ضُرُورِيًا مُسَاوِيًّا فِي الْقُوَةِ وَالْجَلَاءِ لِلْرُؤْيَةِ And this acquired knowledge is it's, it's more powerful to mention it in this way, which is what we talked about before, than simply mentioning didn't you know. وَلِهَذَا السَّبَبْ قَالَ لِغَيْرِهِ عَلَى سَبِيلِ الذَّمْ And this is why the same tone, didn't you see, is used in the Qur'an for condemnation. So he's gonna give some examples from the Qur'an, other places where Allah uses the, the verb, أَلَمْ تَرَى Didn't you see? And also in those cases there is condemnation. أَلَمْ يَرَوْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا قَبْلَهُمْ مِنَ الْقُرُونَ Allah says, didn't you see? How many times have we destroyed much before them from all different kinds of towns? Alam ta'lam anna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Didn't you know that Allah is in complete control over all things? So this alam ya'lam, alam ta'lam is kind of has a zajr in it, a sort of a scolding in it, a strong language in it, or a strong consolation in it. Now we read something from Tafsir al Wasit. This was actually a contemporary Tafsir. It was written, the full name of it is Tafsir al Wasit. Fi Tafsir al Quran al Kareem. It was written by Shaykh Nimat Tantawi, rahimahullah. Uh, not the current Tantawi, this is an older Tantawi, rahimahullah. And this was uh, published in 1928. Brilliant tafsir. وَأَوْقَعَ سُبْحَانَهُ الْإِسْتِفْهَامِ And the, 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 messenger, uh, the, the messenger, actually not the messenger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the question word عَنِ الْكَيْفِيَةِ And he placed, placed the question in the way of saying how مَا أَنزَلَهُ بِهِمْ uh, Saying not just what he did with them, but how he did with them. لَا عَنِ الْفِعِلِ ذَاتِهِ لِأَنَّ الْكَيْفِيَةَ أَكْثَرُ دَلَالَةً عَلَىٰ قُدْرِهِ Allah didn't just say what He did with them, He asked the question how He dealt with them. So He's making a distinction between what did Allah do as opposed to how did Allah do. Now the surah is talking about not what Allah did, but how Allah did. كَيْفَ The Arabic word is كَيْفَ He's saying the benefit of كَيْفَ in the ayah is it illustrates the what Allah did in far more detail. What did you do? I ate. How did you eat? Now you're asking for a lot of details, right? So when you ask the word kayfa, it requires a more detailed response. Well, if you ask the word ma, what did your Lord do? It could be a one word response, He destroyed, He killed, He got rid of them. But the word how, it necessitates these demands and also illustrates the power of Allah in more explicit detail. The second question. أَلَمْ تَرَى كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ This actually we, we covered, uh, move to the next uh, question. And by the way, as an indication of that, the, the importance of the word kayfa, it's used for amazement. In other words, these Arabs are being made to think, how could that be? Just think about that. How could it be that an army of elephants would show up at your borders and you have no armies to defend them and no harm comes to you? No, none whatsoever. And even when the plague hits, we'll talk about the plague that came as a result of the corpses rotting. There was a plague in Arabia. And even the plague hit, it only hit those of the army of Abraha. And by the way, when you, you, know, you send a delegation or armies or soldiers and they die abroad, when they die abroad, the nation who sent them gets enraged and sends another army after them. That's what normally happens. Right? Because our sons died on the other side, we're gonna go avenge them. But actually, Abraha survived. 
He didn't die in Arabia. He actually made it all the way back to Yemen. <coughs> and by the time he got back, the, the pebbles that had hit them, the sijil, hijarat ibn sijil that's coming in the surah, it caused a disease of the skin on him that was peeling his skin off, literally burning it off. So the, the, the Yemeni people saw this mutilated form of Abraha, which terrified them of the idea of ever going back to Mecca again. Because they said, even if we can kill those people, we're gonna get disease and get killed like this guy. So it was an amazing plan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The very thing that would have enraged the Yemeni empire even more, was a means by which they were completely deterred forever. But more on that inshallah ta'ala a little bit later. Just on the word how again, how amazing this plan was. Because Allah mentions the word how, not what. The same thing He does. أَفَلَمْ يَنظُرُوا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَوْقَهُمْ كَيْفَ بَنَيْنَاهَا Didn't you look at the sky? Didn't they look at the sky above them? Stare at it? Not just what He created, كَيْفَ بَنَاهَا How did He make it? How could that be created? How could that be designed? Now think about that, a construction project, right? A construction project. How did they make this building? My God, it's amazing. I come from New York. Our masjids are very small. Right? We have like one big masjid. And that's because it was funded from abroad. We don't have that kind of money. You know, the, kind, the, the, the amount of money it takes to buy a house in Texas, you can buy a bathroom in New York, right? So it's a different economy. So you, go, you come from Texas, I came from New York the first time with my brother-in-law. And we came, and we pulled into the parking lot of the Irving Mush, and we're like, how did they do this? <laughs> we're amazed at the construction project. How is this possible? In America? Wow! <laughs> right? This idea of how, so Allah is asking the question about His construction of the sky, the horizons, the expansive universe. By the way, as sama doesn't just mean sky, that's a shallow translation. Sama means everything above. Everything above. Whatever lies above you, have you wondered what kind of architectural plans are involved in the construction of this universe that lies above you and hovers above you? Subhanallah. Kaifa. It's used to, to inspire amazement in the one that is being spoken to. وَلَا شَكَّ أَنَّ هَذِهِ الْوَاقِعَةِ كَانَتْ دَالَّةٌ عَلَىٰ, قد... دالة على قُدْرَةِ الصَّانِعِ There is no doubt about it that this incident was clearly a proof of the power of the manufacturer, the creator. وَعِلْمَهُ وَحِكْمَتَهُ And his knowledge and his wisdom. وَكَانَتْ دَالَّةً عَلَىٰ شَرْفِ مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Now we're coming to a new topic. And this incident is also a proof of the honor, the nobility of the Prophet ﷺ وَذَلِكَ Why would this be a proof of the honor of the Prophet? وَذَلِكَ لِأَنَّ مَذْهَبَنَا أَنَّهُ يَجُوزْ تَقْدِيمَ الْمُعْجِزَاتِ عَلَىٰ زَمَانِ الْبَعْثَ And that is because in our opinion, in our religion, it is known that miraculous things occur before the time of the appointment of a messenger. Right before a messenger is appointed, miraculous things start happening, and this is one of the great miraculous things. That sees and linubuatihim as a confirmation and an indication of their prophethood. Wa irsahan laha, wa lidalika kalu kanat il ghamama tadilluhu. And that's how the, that that is why they say the clouds used to cast shadow over him. Right? In other words, even that the clouds would follow him miraculously, and the, you know you know about the narrations of the plants making sajda and things like that. But even before his birth, a huge mu'jiza to indicate this this amazing event that is coming. Now we're going to look at some poetry of Abdul Muttalib in response to this incident. Now you would say, I mean, he's the head of the town; they're about to tear his city up, and he's making poetry. Well, let me let me explain something to you. Poetry in Arabia was a means of actually uh, uh, supplication. And actually when we study this poem, we'll see he's actually talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's making dua to Allah in this poem, in this very poetic fashion. So it's really a poetic prayer is what is narrated in the books of tafsir. لَا هُمْ إِنَّ الْمَرْأَ يَمْحَلُهُ فَمْنَعْ حَلَالَكَ There's no doubt about it. There's a man who has the intent of wreaking havoc in, in it, meaning in it, the Kaaba, the Bayt, the Bayt of Allah, and he wants to wreak havoc in it, and he wants to destroy it. Then keep him from your halal. It's a very interesting language. You know what the house is called? Al-Bayt al-Haram, right? And he says it's haram for everyone else, who is it halal for? You. That house that is only permissible for you and for everyone else, it's sanctified, it's haram. That house, you can, you're the only one who can prevent them from attacking it. Wansur ala al salib And it help <coughs> against the people of the crucifix. Why? Because Abraha and his armies, remember that? They were Christian influence from Habasha. And they actually got the elephants from Habasha, from Africa. So he's saying the, the people of the crucifix. Wa'abidihi And the people who worship it. 
Al-Yawma, help them today. Alak, help your own people against the people of the crucifix and those who worship that crucifix. Okay? So he's saying, we are your people, we're the ones who protect your house, help us against them. لا يغلبن صليبهم ومحانهم عدوان or عدوان actually. Their, uh, let not their crucifix or their plans of destruction ever overcome out of animosity mahalak your place this is your you know your house and your sanctity let them not ever reach this in kunta tarikahum wa ka'batuna and if you are going to leave them and you're going to abandon our ka'bah then fa'mur ma badalak then do whatever you want then it's your then it's your decision so this is the statement he made then he said another thing, yeah, he made dua against them, but this is the softness of the man, I suppose. Ya Rab, la arju lahum waka. My master, I don't, I don't wish for them. Wak is used, waka is used in Arabic for, you know, the um, crop season. Crop season, the farmer puts in all his work, and at the end there's harvest. And at that time he's really, really happy. He's saying, I don't wish, har- I don't wish harvest for them. In other words, they put a lot of, clearly they put a lot of labor and planning into getting here to destroy it. But I don't wish ever that they see the fruit of their labor. I don't wish that they, you know, succeed. Ya Rab, famna anhum habaka. Then he says, protect them or, or keep them from attacking those who support you. So that's the prayers or the poetic supplications of Abdul Muttalib. Now we talk a little bit about the use of the word fi'l, which is very important. The, uh, the word fi'l in Arabic, according to uh, Taj al Arus, which is a very famous lexicon of the Arabic language, includes three things Al Amal, of course, action. Al-haraka, movement. Al-hadith, incident, something that occurs. It is used only for tangible things. In other words, you know, it's not used to talk about abstract things. Something physically that occurred, something moved from one to another, then fi'l is used. Okay. The Arabs used it in idioms like bi-fi'li kadha. Uh, meaning bi They would use a verb like, or an expression like bi-fi'li kadha, meaning because of its impact. So the word fi'l was even used in the meaning of impact. Also, fi'lan or bil fi'l is used in Arabic for, to, to illustrate haqiqatan. In other words, when you say bil fi'l in Arabic, or fi'lan, it means of course, obviously, truly, or actually. These are, this is the, you know, how it's used. So it, again, referring to something that actually takes place. It's not abstract, it's not in the realm of a hypothetic, hypothetical. So, this fi'l, why not say ja'ala, why not say khalaqa, why not say amila? Well, first of all, the reason for not using ja'ala and khalaqa is that fi'l can actually include both of them. So it's a more comprehensive term. The word is more comprehensive. The second, the, the reason for not using amila is also very interesting. The word amal and fi'l both in, from Arabic to English get translated as action. That's how they both get translated. But amal is actually an action with intent. And fi'l is an action with or without intent. That's one difference between the two. Amal is also an action that takes an effort. And fi'l can be an action that takes no effort. And interestingly, in the Qur'an, amal is not used for Allah, but fi'l is used for Allah over and over again, signifying that there is no effort. There is no effort when Allah doesn't act. Efforts are the quality of human beings, right? فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَادٌ Right? Same thing here. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Amal is not used, fi'l is used. Why? Because it's effortless for Allah Azza wa Jal. The other benefit of not using amal is actually, this is from مُخَالِفَ uh, الْمَعْنَى uh, In Arabic rhetoric they say, when you say uh, amal was done, meaning an action was done based on intent, then you're, you're alluding to the fact that other actions may have been done without intent. And that would be in an inappropriate assumption about Allah Azza wa Jal. So amal is not used for that reason. Now, uh, actually, we'll, we'll move forward, forward inshallah ta'ala. And by the way, uh, in uh, Alusi's tafsir, he makes another interesting comment. فَلَوْ ذَكَرَ الْأَلْفَاظِ الثَّلَاثَ لَطَالَ الْكَلَامِ Had he mentioned all three words, the speech would have been prolonged unnaturally. فَذَكَرَ لَفْضًا يَشْمِلُ الْكُلْ So he mentioned a word that incorporates everything appropriately. So the most comprehensive speech, this is a quality of Qur'an. The most comprehensive speech, little words, this is a surah you've memorized since you were kids. We're spending three sessions on it, when it's like five ayat, very very short. And it's a, you know, it's a Sunday school surah, I call it a Sunday school surah, because it's easy to teach us. You know what happened? Yeah, we already know what happened. There was an elephant thing happened, and you, know, and you pass through it, subhanAllah. But there are just, in every word, there's a treasure embedded. Inside every single word, there's depth, there's wisdom embedded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, we covered that, now let's move on to the next question. Now, he used the word, Rabbuka. أَلَمْ تَرَكَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ He didn't use the word Allah. 
He didn't use the word Allah. This is important. You see, Allah, inshallah, when we get time, we'll argue, is actually an ism alam. It's a name of Allah. And it includes all the qualities of Allah Azza wa Jalla. If you want to refer to Allah in one word, that refers to every one of His qualities, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, every one of them, the only word you can use that refers to all of His qualities would be Allah. <coughs> but when you use the word Rabb, it signifies one specific attribute. And that attribute is that of being a master and therefore having slaves. That's the, the salient. There are other things inside Rabb. Al-Mun'im, Al-Qayyim, Al-Murabbi, right? Wal-Mu'ti. There are other meanings in Rabb. But the salient feature is master and therefore necessitating the existence of slaves. Why is that important? Because this surah is not just giving you a historical fact. It's telling you that this was done by your master, so you need to act like slaves. This, it's, it, so there's a, there's a conclusion that's being demanded in the language. If you just say Allah, كَيْفَ فَعَلَ اللَّهُ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Then yes, it's a historical fact, but it's not putting any demands on me. The word Rabb in and of itself is important here because it's placing demands on them. And this is going to become absolutely clear in the next surah because what does Allah say? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ Then they should enslave themselves as a consequence to the master of this house. And what reasons did he give in the next surah? أَلَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ And then, what's the final reason? وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ He gave them safety against fear. And that, that safety against fear is Surah Al-Feel. That's what Surah Al-Feel is about. So Allah is making that demand openly there, but explicit, implicitly in this surah. Now, then, then why say, رَبَّ كَا Now let's look at the word ka here. Ka referring to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, your master. You see in the next surah, he says he's the master of the house. Doesn't he? رَبَّ هَذَا bayt. But before he mentions his, that he is Rabb of the house that he's willing to protect, he mentions his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So if he's going to protect the house, but he mentions the house later, who did he mention first? His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa will not his, mes- his protection come to the aid of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa This is actually a very powerful rhetorical thing. Because you know, Surah Quraysh is more about the economics of Quraysh. Surah Al-Feel is about the Kaaba. But the Kaaba is not mentioned in Surah Al-Feel. The Kaaba is not mentioned in Surah, it's mentioned in Surah Quraysh. But who is mentioned in Surah Al-Feel? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa This is further fortifying what we alluded to before. When Allah poses this question, He is telling His Messenger, I, will, I protected the Kaaba, but more so I am here to protect you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so we find the commentary, Rabb, uh, we'll read through it, min wujuh, ahaduha. There are several benefits of saying Rabbuka, the first of them, ka'annahu ta'ala qal, it is as though Allah said, innahum lamma shahadu hadha al-intiqam, it is no doubt when these people witnessed this revenge that Allah took, thumma lam yatruku ibadat al-awthan, and thereafter still didn't abandon the worship of idols, wa anta ya Muhammadu, ma shahadtahu, shahadtahu, uh, you O Muhammad did not see those events, you didn't see them physically, thumma atarafta, then you realized, bishukri wa ta'a, but you still acknowledge the favor of Allah upon you with gratitude and with obedience, faka'annaka anta alladhi ra'ayta thalik, <coughs> an intiqam, and it is as though you saw that revenge of Allah that Allah had taken, فَلَا جَرَمَ تَبَرَّأْتَ عَنْهُمْ وَاخْتَرْتُكَ مِنَ الْكُلْ And it's, it's clear that you disassociated yourself from those who do shirk in your own town. And I have picked you over everyone else. In other words, this is sort of a testimony to the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and him being picked as the final messenger. فَأَقُولْ Then I say, رَبُّكْ أَيْ أَنَا لَكْ وَلَسْتُ لَهُمْ بَلْ عَلَيْهِمْ by saying, Rabbuk, your master, your Lord. What Allah is saying is, I am for you, I am in your, I am in your favor, I am on your side, and I am not in, on their side, actually I am against them. I stand against them. Just like I stood against Abraha and his armies. So this is a means of tahweel, of terrifying them. That, he, that Allah Azza wa Jal, the same Allah who destroyed Abraha, is now on the side, clearly on the side of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Now, the second benefit. إِنَّمَا فَعَلْتَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ ذَلِكْ تَعْظِيمًا Or فَعَلْتُ rather. I only did this, I did this for the, against the people of the elephant, the elephant people. تَعْظِيمًا لَكَ To show the greatness of you, meaning the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَتَشْرِيفًا لِمُقَدِّمِكْ And to honor your arrival. فَأَنَا كُنْتُ مُرَبِّيًا لَكْ قَبْلَ قَوْمِكْ And I have been the caretaker of your nation for you, even before your nation. فَكَيْفَ أَطْرُكُ تَرْبِيَتَكْ بَعْدَ ظُهُورِكْ And then how am I going to leave your caretaking after your, your, you've become a messenger? فَفِيهِ إِشَارَةٌ لَهُ عَلَيْهِ بَشَارَةٌ لَهُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ بِأَنَّهُ سَيَوْفِرُ 
And in it also there's an indication that he will be, the Messenger والسلام, will actually be victorious and will overcome the city of Mecca and be able to cleanse Allah's house. Now, we talked about why not use the word Allah Azza wa Jal, why not use that word, and why not even say Rabbul Ka'bah, but Rabbuka, uh, referring to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we go on to a comment by Al-Biqa'i Rahmahullah, and then we move on. What ta'bil bil Rabb, and by calling, referring to a Rabb, and using that terminology, ma'at tashrif lahu, uh, again, to illustrate the nobility of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Al-ishara bi dhikri ta'reeb bi hiqarat al-asnam Al-lati sammuha arbab lahum And by using Rabbuka what, Another thing Allah has done in between the lines He has illustrated the ugliness And the pathetic nature of shirk that is being done at that house He is the master who protected this house How dare you put other masters to worship How dare you put those other idols there He is your master Right? So this, just by using the word Rabb, it is almost a negation of the shirk that is being done there, and an attack against it. <coughs> this is, now we get, it gets really interesting. Just the language of Ashab al-Feel, commonly translated again, people of the elephant, or we said one possible rendition, the elephant people. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ أَرْبَابَ الْفِيلِ And the, Allah didn't say the masters of the elephant. أَوْ مَلَاكَ الْفِيلِ Or the owners of the elephant. He didn't use those words. He specifically used the word Ashab. Which it means people of, companions of, associates of. Ashab and sahaba is used of course for the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a common word, you're familiar with it. Now, let's understand a few things about this because there's amazing literary power in this. لِأَدْنَ sahib يَكُونَ مِنَ الْجِنْسِ because the word sahib can be a categorical kind of statement. Ashabul fil yadullu ala anna ulaik al aqwam kanu min jinsil fil fil bahimiya. And by using this word as a categorical statement, calling them elephant people, it's like Allah is saying they are elephant like people. They have features of animals, they have behavior and etiquette and morals of animals. So they are like animals. <laughs> By calling them Ashab al fil It's a sort of a, an insult. وَعَدْمَ الْفَهْمُ وَالْعَقْلِ And it's, it illustrates a lack of understanding and intellect. بَلْ فِيهِ دَقِيقَةً And there's even a more subtle comment here. وَهِيَ أَنَّهُ إِذَا حَصَلَتِ الْمُصَاحَبَةً بَيْنَ شَخْصَيْنِ This is also really important. Whenever there's companionship between two parties, two persons, فَيُقَالْ Then it is said, لِلْأَدْوَنُ إِنَّهُ صَاحِبُ الْأَعْلَى The lower, so there's two people that have companionship. One is lesser, one is higher. And the lesser one is said, this lesser one is the sahib of this higher one. So the lower guy, the, the one who is in a lower position in a relationship, is the sahib, and the one in the higher position is the other. In other words, for example, who's in a higher position, the messenger or the sahaba? The sahaba. So, but you can't say that the prophet is their companion, and they are the prophet's companion. Who's given the phrase companion? The lower party or the higher party? The lower party. You understand what he's saying? Now he says... The people were given the lower party, and the elephants were given the higher party, because they're even worse. بَلْ هُمْ أَبَنْ They're even worse than animals. <coughs> and he proves this point. He says, rhetorically it's there, but what's the proof of it? يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ أُولَيْكَ الْأَقْوَامِ كَانُوا أَقَلُّ حَالٍ وَأَدْوَنُ مَنْزِلَةٍ مِنَ الْفِيلِ It illustrates that they were, these were less, worse off in their state, and lower in their status than even the elephants. And why? Because when the, when the uh, elephants were commanded to destroy the house, وَمِمَّا يُؤَكِّدُ ذَلِكَ And what further fortifies this concept? أَنَّهُمْ كُلَّمَا وَجَهُ الْفِيلِ إِلَى جِهَةِ الْكَعْبَةِ Every time they, they pointed the elephant in the direction of the Kaaba, كَانَ يَتَحَوَّلْ عَنْهُ وَيَفِرُّ عَنْهُ He would turn away from it and run away. In other words, you know how the messenger says, لَا طَاعَةَ لِمَخْلُوقٍ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ This animal understood it better than them. The animal refuses to destroy the Kaaba and turns away. And these human beings who are clearly in this situation worse than animals, they don't understand that and they're bent upon its destruction. So this <coughs> in and of itself proves أن الفيلة كان أحسن, كان أحسن حالا منهم that he, the, the elephant was in a better position, in a better state than even they were when it comes to their, his purpose in creation. Then, أليس, كفار, uh, أليس أن كفار قريش كانوا ملأوا الكعبة من الأوثان uh, من قديم الدهر? This very important question. He says, isn't it true that the kufar of Quraysh had filled the Kaaba with idols for a very long time? So they have done a crime against the Kaaba for a very long time. Fine. ولا شك أن ذلك كان أقبح من تخريب. تخريب جدران الكعبة. And it seems very clear, there's no doubt about it, that that crime of shirk is a worse crime than even destroying the walls of the Kaaba. 
he poses a, a very important philosophical almost question, right? Al-Fasir. This is uh, Al-Lusi rahimahullah. He says, think about this. That on the one hand, Quraysh have been doing shirk in the house Allah had commanded to be built for His worship alone. They have been doing shirk in that house for centuries. And on top of that, now somebody wants to come and destroy this house. Aren't they both criminals? And he says actually, from a point of view of from Iman, who's the bigger criminal? The bigger criminal, I mean, Abraha we learn only wants to do this for economic reasons. He has no kufr or rebellion against Allah. What's the bigger crime here? Shirk. So the question is, how come Allah destroyed Abraha, but He didn't destroy the Quraysh. So he asked this question, فَلِمَا صَلَّتَ اللَّهُ الْعَذَابِ عَلَى مَنْ قَصَدَ التَّخْرِيبِ How come Allah waged His destruction, His punishment, His torture upon the one who intended destruction for the Kaaba? وَلَمْ يُصَلِّتِ الْعَذَابِ عَلَى مَنْ مَلَأَهَا مِنَ الْأَوْثَانِ And he didn't, he didn't wreak His havoc and wreak His destruction upon the one who filled it up with idols. وَالْجَوَابِ And here's the response, لِأَنَّ وَضْعَ الْأَوْثَانِ فِيهَا تَعُدْ عَلَى حَقِّ اللَّهِ because destroying or, or doing uh, shirk is a violation of the right of Allah. But destroying the Kaaba would be a violation of the right of the people. This is the house built as a mercy for humanity. This, this house is a right of the people so that they would turn in the right direction and pray. This house was built so that humanity would have guidance. This was supposed to be the center. So it's the right of the people versus the right of Allah. And Allah prolongs and doesn't punish immediately when His rights are violated, but He comes to the protection of the people. SubhanAllah. وَالسُؤَالَ الثامن. And again, the next question. كَيْفَ الْقَوْلِ فِي الْعَرَابِ and This is just a grammatical issue. He's talking about the word كَيْفَ and why is it in the nasb state. Basically, it's uh, كَيْفَ is because of uh, فَعَلَ not because of alam tara, which is a grammatical, it's a minor issue. It doesn't really affect the meaning all that much. So we're going to skip that part. Now finally, alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil. The second alam. The first alam was, alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel. The second alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil. Now didn't he, common translation, didn't he make their plot in waste? This is very literal translation. Or didn't he place their plot in vain, in naught? <coughs> or reduce it to nothing? First, let's pay attention to the word alam. It's mentioned again. So the first question was alam. The second is again, alam. And here, the, the purpose of this, these are the only two alam by the way, there's no third, right? These are the only two. And these are the only two present tenses, tara and yaj'al. Now there's arsala after this, right? And ja'ala after this, and so the language changes a little bit. Now, I told you, I mentioned before, when the present tense is used, there's a continuity. There's a continuity. And if you look at the language, he took their plot and reduced it to waste. This is something not only that Allah did for them, but anyone who makes plots against Allah's deen, Allah will do this over and over and over again, hence justifying the use of the present tense, yaj'al in this case. Even though the meaning comes out in the past tense, the conjugation is in the present form, the mudara form. That's the first thing. Then the word ja'ala as opposed to fa'ala. But the first ayah said, fa'ala, kaifa? Fa'ala. Here, referring to Allah, alam yaj'al, that alam yaf'al. Different verb is being used. What's the benefit here? Ja'ala is to take something that already exists and transform it. What the word itself indicates is, Allah, let them have their plan. Let them finish the entire execution of it. Plan it out for months and months. Get secure the funds, secure the army, secure the training, secure the means for the journey. Let them run it the whole way and put it to waste at the very end. He transformed, he morphed the plan at the very end. In other words, he didn't deviate the plan in the beginning. He could have not allowed them to consume an army or to, to amass an army, or to come up with the funds, or to be able to make it all the way. You know, they, they could have never met Abu Rigal. Remember the navigator that got them all the way to Mecca? They could have never met him if Allah had wanted. But he let them think the plan is in order. But he took that plan and made it different at, at the very end. So that's what Ja'ala seems to indicate. Is that this is, alam yaj'al. That Allah Azza wa Jalla let them play, played them along. Basically played them. And at the end, Allah Azza wa Jalla pulled the strings on them. By the way, this, I don't know if I've given you this parallel before, but it's, a, it's an interesting parallel. My teacher, Dr. Sami, used to give it to me. He says, when someone's rebellious, one of the things Allah does is, uh, He lets them go free. And they, they feel like they got no problems, they can get away with anything. And it's compared to a dog that is wild. It's barking at you, it's biting at you. So you tie it up, right? And you tie it up with a one-foot leash. So it can't really move much. But if you really want to punish this dog, you take it in an open field and tie it to a 400-foot leash. Because if you tie it to a 400 foot leash, you know what's going to happen? It's going to think that it's free and it's running full speed. 
right? When it's, it's only a foot long leash, it can only pull so much. When it's running full speed and it reaches 400 feet, what happens? You see, it gets yanked, it gets choked, and that pain is far worse than the one foot leash. The dog thinks he's got freedom, but this is actually worse for him. وَيَمُدُّهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ Allah extends them in their rebellion. Let them remain blind in it. So Allah extended their means all the way to get to the Kaaba. Allah could have destroyed them much before. But He let them execute their plan. Let them play along. Let them dig their hole deeper. This will only make their punishment worse. Not only are they mushrikun, but they're committing crimes against Allah Azza wa <coughs> Okay. Now the words arsala and you know when we get to them, I'll skip this part, so I'll just tell you now. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ is very particular punishment given to these people. So the past tense is used, which does not include continuity, which there is no need for, because that particular punishment is not repeated by Allah Azza wa Jalla. It was specifically sent to them. And the proof of that specific sending, inshallah, when we get to that ayah. Now, Qaid, another really interesting uh, comment, and this is where you'll see the benefit of that discussion we had before. The word Qaid in Arabic is used similar to the word Makr. So there are two words for making a plan, plot. Really not a plan, a plot. Qaid and Makr. Qaid is used for a plan made in secret. So it's a, the, the thing highlighted in a plot. And by the way, by plot, I mean a plan made to harm someone. That's what Qaid basically is. A plan made to harm someone. So you know, military plans can be called Qaid. But city planning cannot be called Qaid. You understand? When a plan is made like for a military offense or to rob someone, ambush, things like that, that would be Qaid. If it is made in secret. Now if a plan is made to deceive someone, or deception is being used as part of the plan, right? Deception in planning. That's makr. So when people are being misled, that's makr. When, pe- when things are being kept secret, that is Qaid. These are the two kinds of plots that are linguistically mentioned. Now Allah mentions Qaid. Alam yaj'al Qaidahum. Didn't he take their plot, implying the plot was secretive, and put it to waste? Now I haven't ex- explained that put it to waste part, but just this plot part. Let's see the question. اعلم أن الكيد هو إرادة مضرة بالغيب على الخفية. Know that kaid is a word used for an intent made to harm someone, harm the other, and it's made secretly. In Qila, and if you were to ask, فلما سماه كيدا وأمره كان ظاهرا. How come it's called Qaid while his plan was very open? I mean, he, came, he didn't come by night. He came openly with his army. So why call it a secret plan? Well, Qaid, iradat wuqu'i al-idrar bil ghayr fi al-khafi. Another commentary, same exact thing. Wa summiya subhanahu ma fa'alahu abraha wa jayshahu kaidan ma'a annahum ja'u li hadam al-ka'ba jiharan naharan. They came, even though they came in the midst of the day, and they came without any secrecy. So how can we understand this word in this ayah? لِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُضْمِرُونَ مِنَ الْحَقَدْ وَالْحَسَدْ وَالْعَدَاوَةِ لِأَهْلِ مَكَّةِ One explanation, this is the explanation repeated. Every mufassir that I read that asked this question had pretty much the same answer, which has been, because they were hiding in their hearts an animosity against the Meccans, that was even worse than the one they were showing. So that's, they're saying that part of it was secret. I personally wasn't very satisfied with that response. Because it seems to me that a historical analysis of the events yields a much more powerful response to this question. Now it may be true, you know, مَمَا تُخْفِي صُدُورُهُمْ أَكْبَرُ Allah mentions this attitude of kuffar, what they're hiding in their hearts is even worse. That may be true and that may be secret. But, you know, in a, in a society that, is, that revolves around religion, in a society that revolves around religion, and of course, in modern times, mostly nations are trying to push themselves as a secular state. So religion is not the central force in the Christian world or in the Muslim world. It's not the central force. But in the ancient world, religion played a central role in every society, be it pagan, Hindu, Christian, Jewish, Muslim. Religion plays a central role. Now, if religion plays, it is your constitution, it is what you have your allegiance to. When you say you're proud to be, you don't mention nation, you mention religion. Right? That was the world view of the past, the pre-modern era. And in that time, if you want to galvanize the people and motivate the people to take military action, what do you use to justify your actions? You use religion. You know, in modern times, you can use patriotism. You can use for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our people, for the sake of our land. By the way, is religion even today used to extend military means and manipulate people? Sure. All religions, by the way. It's not just you know, one or the other, it's all religions. Use religion as a means of oppression against another. It's possible, it does happen. Now, 
<coughs> we, we, when, when we study the historical account, we learn that the motivations were actually not religious. What were they? They were political, they were economic. The, you know, the Yemen was no longer the economic capital. That had shifted to Mecca. And to get their attention back, and to get that revival going, of the, the trade power going, they had to now make an offense against Mecca. But they covered it up with what facade? With religion. This is our new Kaaba, this is Qulays, they don't come and worship this, they're not Christian people, so they're gonna come with the Salib, they're gonna come with the crucifix, and they're gonna make it look like this is a war of religions, the war of faiths. And we're standing up for the religion, and they're galvanizing their people for this cause. Of course, no, Habasha was a very strong Christian state. For them to offer elephants or anything else as military support, already suggests they saw it as a Christian thing to justify to their people. But what's the hiding underneath, what's the real qaid, is really something else. They have monetary advances. By the way, this qaid is interesting to mention, because this is the same problem with the Quraysh. On the outside, they're saying, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهَ وَاحِدَا He took he took all of our gods and made them into one. Inna هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ This is a very, very strange thing. We don't get it. How can all those gods be turned into one? That's on the outside. But you know what's going on on the inside? Their entire economy. Their entire economy. I'll give you a comparison. What if you said, uh, someone com comes out, some movement comes out in Las Vegas and said, we need to get rid of all the casinos. Right? We need to get rid of all the casinos. And somebody says, no, this is part of our history, it's part of our heritage, it's part of our culture. Is that the real reason? that people would be against, it's the money. It's the people that are coming in, right? So you can cover it up with heritage and history and this and that or the other, but the underlying causes are still there. And this is really exactly what the Quraysh were doing. You get rid of the idols, they have no political power because all the idols are being held hostage in Mecca. So people have to come and do hajj. And when they have to come and do hajj there, they have to go shopping. And when they have to go shopping, their economy booms. That's how it works. And they can go outside and travel without fear. Why? Because the other pagans respect them as custodians of the house where their idols are being held hostage. You get rid of this system, their entire economy collapses. That entire mafia system is finished. So the word qaid is alluding to the qaid of abraha and the undertones of economic pursuit. But also it's referring to it kind of a, 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 kind of a poke at and a pun at even the Quraysh and the Qaid that they made against the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah says, if I can take their Qaid, which was much bigger, and He can put that to waste, what is your Qaid going to be? Because those who you couldn't defy against, you had to run up into the mountains, those are the ones I put to waste, what are you going to do? Where do you stand? Right? So there's this comparison taking place remarkably in this surah. So, that's just the use of the word qaid. Now let's talk about dallala, uh, yudallilu, tadlil. Usually in the Quran, dal is used, dalla. But this is dallala, tadlil. It's the, it's the uh, masdar of at tafil, bab at tafil. So let's understand the difference between it. Dalla to, to, to be lost, literally. To lose, to be lost. <coughs> to place something where you can no longer find it, etc. Dallala to waste, to destroy. Ay dayyahu, to put it completely to waste, where it's no longer usable at all. Alam yaj'al, uh, this is the tafsir commentary. Alam yaj'al sa'i al-habasha, ashab al-feel, fi takhrib al-ka'ba, fi tadlil, ya'ni, didn't we pay, take the efforts of the habasha, the people of the elephant, in the destruction of the Kaaba? Didn't we put it into waste? Meaning, fi tadlilihim amma aradu wa hawalu min takhribiha, in wasting their plans in regards to the efforts they made in destroying it. This is the base meaning. But then they go a step further. The word tadlil in Arabic, taf'il generally has repetition in it. In other words, Allah at many occasions put it to waste. The first time they built the, the Qulays, they thought, how, who's gonna compare with this super mall that we've built of a Kaaba, compared to that old rinkety place over there in Mecca, who's gonna go there now that we have this? That failed. Then they tried to convince people to turn in this direction, that failed. Then they, they, you know, another failure was burnt. It was burnt down, we, we learned about that, and it was defecated upon, etc. So that's another tablil. Then they came all the way here to destroy the Kaaba, and that went, that went into failure. So, in, if anything, it added to the awe and respect for the Kaaba rather than reducing it. It only, you know, uh, put their entire plan to waste. So, one after another, their plans were destroyed. وَمَا دُعَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ إِلَّا فِي ضُلَالًا Like Allah says, what is the prayer of disbelievers except being put to waste? Now, a little bit more commentary, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, the word fi, the use of the word fi, this is also very important. When, he, when the Mufassir says, حَرْفَ الظَّرْفَ شَوْكَانِ He's referring to the word fi. Allah didn't say He put their plan to waste. He said He put their plan in utter waste. 
Now what's the benefit of saying in? In Arabic, in is used to give you imagery. That's why he calls it harf al-dharf. Dharf literally means a location, a space, a time, right? So it's either dharf, zaman or makan, time or space. In this case, he's almost making you visualize, it is as though you take something good and you throw it in a fire where it's burned to a crisp and it's useless. It can't be used anymore. So Allah took their entire elaborate plan, which was so well made, and He completely put it to waste. And that waste is clear for everyone to see. So that element of being able to see, كَانَ قَدْ ظَهْرٌ لِكُلِّ عَاقِلٍ It could be easy for anyone to see how that elaborate plan was completely destroyed and wasted. ضَلَّلَ Actually, one more uh, linguistic comment on it. Uh, Imr al-Qais uh, was also called this al-Malik al-Dhalil. Dhalil with dhal, not dhal. That's the other word. Okay? Al-Dhalil. Imr al-Qais was called the king with the quality of dhalil. Why? لِأَنَّهُ ضَلَّلَ مُلْكَ أَبِيهِ أَيْ ضَيَّعَهُ because he wasted the fortunes of his father, he inherited kingdom, and he wasted the fortunes of his father, so his name became Dalil, because he put it to complete waste. He could have done so much with it, but he wasted the whole thing. Now we get to the last uh, two ayat, inshallah ta'ala, or three ayat. Uh, maybe I'll go ten more minutes, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll conclude next week, and combine Surah Al-Fil with it. Let's see. Let me at least finish this third ayah, and then we'll conclude. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيِّرًا أَبَابِينَ And he sent against them, Birds, that's, I'm, I'm, again, literal translation right now. He sent against them birds, uh, ababil, herds upon herds upon herds. Now, just a historical comment describing the, the, the birds. When Abdul Muttalib turns back, فَالْتَفَتَ He turned away. وَهُوَ يَدْعُو And he was making dua to Allah. فَإِذَا هُوَ بِطَيْرٍ Then all of a sudden he sees birds. مِنْ نَحْوِ الْيَمَنْ from the, Coming from the direction of Yemen. Which is interesting because the army also came from Yemen, right? Wallahu, wallahi, he says, Faqal, he says, I swear by Allah, إِنَّهَا لَطَيْرٌ غَرِيبَةٌ It is very strange kinds of birds for sure. مَا هِيَ بِنَجْدِيَّةٌ وَلَا تَهَمِّيَّةٌ They're not from Najd and they're not from Tahama. كَانَ مَعَ كُلِّ طَائِرٍ حِجْرٍ فِي مِنْ قَارِهِ وَحِجْرًا فِي رِجْلَيْهِ And in every single bird, there would be a, a pebble in its beak and a, two pebbles in each of its claws, in its feet. Okay, so that's his description of it. فَكَانَ الْحِجْرِ يَقَعُ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِ الرَّجُلِ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْ دُبْرِهِ Then the, the stone that they would land, these rocks, these pebbles that would land, they would land on the head of a person and come out from behind them. قَالَ أَبُوْ عُبَيْدَ أَبَابِيل Abu Ubaidah describing the word ababil says, جَمَعَاتْ فِي تَفَرُّقَ Multiple groups of different kinds. In other words, it wasn't one species of bird, there were many different species of words. Um, and that will come more later on also. يُقَالْ جَاءَتَ الْخَيْلْ أَبَابِيلِ It is also said the, the horses came, <coughs> herds upon herds from many different directions. أَيْ جَمَعَاتْ مِنْ هَاهُنَا وَهَاهُنَا Groups upon groups coming from here and there. قَالَ النُحَاسْ Nuhas, a great, a great um, grammarian of our history, wrote I'arab al-Qur'an. وَحَقِيقَتُهُ أَنَّهَا جَمَعَاتْ عِظَامْ And the reality is that these are huge groups. Huge, awesome flocks of birds. Not one, but many different flocks of birds. I haven't seen too many birds in Texas. But you know, if you travel between like New York and Maryland, sometimes birds are migrating, especially in the area of Delaware. A lot of birds, right? So you'll see for a good half hour, just a flock of tens of hundreds of thousands of birds, a continuous stream. And according to other historical narrations, they were coming from every direction, and you couldn't see the sky, it became dark. SubhanAllah. It's an incredible scene to even imagine. And so, you know, when we read this language and I'm translating, you can imagine the Arabs, because they have such picturesque imagery in their language. When this story was told over and over and over again, you can imagine children sitting around and imagining this, as though they can almost see it. And you have to know that the Arabs had an amazing imagination. They really did. They were in the desert. There's nothing really to look at. So when, you have, when you're in that kind of situation, you develop an active imagination, which shows in their literature. Their literature is full of picturesque imagery. And it kind of compensates for the lack of imagery and reality in the terrain of Arabia, you know. Uh, anyhow, so, وَقِيلْ كَانَتْ طَيْرًا خَضْرًا خَرَجَتْ مِنَ الْبَحْرِ And it's said that these were green birds that came out of the ocean. So you have varying narrations historically about the kinds of birds. But, <coughs> you see, what happens sometimes in tafsir, this is my personal comment, you don't have to agree with it, okay. What happens in tafsir sometimes is, our mufassirun, may Allah reward all of them, they get so busy talking about what, uh, sometimes you lose sight of how. Allah didn't pay it, He doesn't want us to pay attention to what species of birds, and how long their beaks were, and what color were they. Which is great information, alhamdulillah we have it. What's the point? Allah didn't say what He did, Allah said, how? How? How can that be? How can small creatures like birds, that are weightless, 
that are literally weightless. Destroy an army associated with the most monumental weights. Elephants. How can that be? How can you take these most two extreme things? You know, a lot of times you'll see if you go to the zoo, there are elephants and there's birds sitting on top of them. Harmless creature to the elephant. The, the creature they would never expect any harm from, right? And then how can that be that Allah uses birds, herds upon herds of them to destroy this monumental army, subhanAllah. Now the use of the word arsala ala, arsala alayhim as opposed to arsala ila. Ala tufidul isti'la, the word ala, it serves the benefit of showing superiority or uh, being above. وَاسْتِعْمَالْ عَلَى فِي الْقُرْآنَ عَجِيب And it's a unique usage in the Qur'an. فِيهِ استِعْلَاء وَتَسَلُّتْ And it includes that of domination and of uh, you know, wreaking havoc upon someone and imposing oneself, forcing upon oneself. وَلِذَانِكَ الْعَذَابِ يَأْتِ بِعَلَى And that is why in the Qur'an when we find Allah sending punishment, He doesn't say أَرْسَلَى He sent to, he said he sent upon ala, which illustrates punishment. Like he sent a, you know, a, a rain upon them or destruction upon them, etc. So to and upon, in English they seem kind of ambiguous, but in Arabic it makes a big difference between ala and ala. So ala, hatta idha fatahna alayhim baban dha adabin shadeed, ala, until we opened the doors against them, upon them, over them, that had punishment of intense value. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا فَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمُ الطُّفَانِ So we find over and over again, we send birds against them, a storm against them. When against is used, ala is used. But when a messenger is sent, a messenger is not punishment, a messenger is mercy. فَأَرْسَلَ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ رَسُولًا Not ala فِرْعَوْنَ, but إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ Illustrating that even though he was sent to Fir'aun, he was still a mercy. If he was sent as a punishment, what word would have been used? Ala, right? So it would have been a different word altogether. So Allah comes al uqubat with punishments. <coughs> so now some commentary on the birds, and then inshallah ta'ala we finish our uh, session for today. وَقَوْلُ تَعَالَى ذِكْرُهُ وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّكَ طَيْرًا مُتَفَرِّقًا This is Tabari's commentary by the way. He sent upon, your master sent upon them birds that were of different nature. يَتْبَعُ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا مِنْ نَوَاحٍ شَتَّى And one group would follow another from different directions. وَهِيَا جَمَاعَ لَا وَاحِدَ لَهَا And ababil, the word ababil is a plural word for which there is no singular in Arabic. Ababil means herds upon herds, groups upon groups, right? Flocks upon flocks in bird terminology. I wouldn't say herds for birds, but you know, flocks upon flocks of birds. Scores upon scores, if you will, right? وَالطَّيِّرْ اسم جمع لِكُلِّ مَا مِنْ شَأْنِهِ أَنْ يَطِيرْ فِي, في الْهَوَاءِ And طَيِّرْ, the word طَيِّرْ is used as a, uh, a, pluralist, a plural noun, a collective noun it's called in English, signifying all birds. So he didn't say طُيُّر, he said طَيِّرْ, which means just all forms of birds. If we just say طُيُّر, birds, but if you say طَيِّرْ, all kinds of birds, they came. وَالتَّنْكِيرُهُ لِلتَّنْوِيعِ وَالتَّهْوِيلِ And making the tanween on it, طَيِّرًا You hear that tanween on it? The benefit of that is that tanwi' illustrating there were many different kinds, وَالتَّهْوِيلِ And to terrify. Because tanween is used in Arabic for adham or igra even. Birds were sent. And it, you know, I'm pounding on it like that because that's what the nasab state does in Arabic sometimes. And so, why is that important to note? Because the Arabs who remember that, they're being told, remember the birds? You know, that's how they're being told. Because this is not something that's some ancient event that they never knew about, this is something they know about. And you, that doesn't scare you, that those birds didn't drop pebbles on you, right? They, they had GPS on you too, but you know, they only dropped it on other targets. So they, they, this is لِلتَّهْوِيلِ to terrify them. So almost inshallah ta'ala, ababil we talked about herds upon herds, similar plurals in Arabic are shamatid, abadid, wa nahmu dhalik. So, uh, just a little bit more about uh, uh, Ababil for those of you that are Arabic students. Ibn Hisham says, Al Ababil, Al Jama'at, Walam Tatakalam in Arab, Biwahid. That the Arabs never use the singular word for Ababil. Ibn Abbas wa Dahak, both of them say, Ababil yat ba'u ba'duhum ba'dan. That Ababil refers to groups that follow one after the other. Hassan al Basri and Qatada say, Al Ababil al Kathira. Ababil refers to that which are many and many. وَقَالَ مُجَاهِدْ أَبَابِيلْ شَتَّى مُتَتَابِعَ مُجْتَمِعَ That they are dispersed, that they are continuous, and they are unified in one place. So they're dispersed in terms of their, their tanwi' their nature, different species of birds, but they're grouped together, bunched together. And they come from المُخْتَلِفَ تَأْتِي مِنْ هَاهُنَا وَمِنْ هَاهُنَا That they are different kinds of birds, this is what Ibn Zayz says, they come from here and from there. أَتَتْهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ And it came upon them from every single direction. 
وَقَالُ الْفَرَّاءُ once again, لَمْ أَسْمَعْ مِنَ الْعَرَبِ فِي تَوْحِيدِهَا شَيْئًا I didn't hear from the Arabs using a singular form of it ever. That's just وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٍ I'm going to give you a little view of inshallah ta'ala what we're going to be doing next week, finishing this surah and moving on to Surah Quraysh. But I, uh, and I want to just mention this one thing. This surah is a gift to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in and of itself, you know, Al-Biqa'i rahimahullah commenting on this surah, he said that, uh, that uh, Allah's Messenger, alayhi wa uh, Allah Azza wa Jal gives His Messenger gifts even before He's born. And He protects His city and the city in which He's going to be born, you know, uh, and the house, and that house which He wasn't even praying in the direction of to begin with. But Allah knew that eventually he will be praying in that direction and he turns back towards the Qibla, Tardaha, to please that Messenger Wasallam. So we have this newly found respect and honor and regard for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because of just the phrase, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka. Just that word rabbuka gives us newly found respect and a refreshed appreciation of how highly Allah regards His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was an event, the Makkah and Salat, this was done for them. They thought Allah protected them. And Allah made it clear, no, 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 no. This is for you. This is for you, number one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah. So may Allah Azza wa Jal give us a clear and a deep understanding of this book and the ability to practice upon it. May Allah Azza wa Jal take the good things that are said and enter it into our hearts. And anything that is incorrect, may He remove it from our memories and our hearts. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil-ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.